Damn it! How long have we been doing this show? The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life, it's episode 340. It's the middle of June of 2023, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. <laughs> and as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. AEW Collision debuts this weekend, and the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Our friend Phil is back. You know, things have been pretty quiet in the (laughs) build-up to Collision. And uh, Tony Khan has decided to sell his fans on Collision by saying, this is a show because TNT asked for two more hours. (laughs) And so we're going to give them two more hours. I wouldn't say the build to this Collision debut has been stellar i wouldn't say that it's been inspired Mm -mm. but then we got a promo from (laughs) cm punk on this week's AEW dynamite it was a taped trailer type deal for collision punk says i don't know what i'm going to do or say till i get in the middle of the ring on the debut of Collision at the United Center on the 17th of June. And I have scores to settle. I have a lot of need to get off my chest. And so, clearly working. Clearly a promo. Clearly storyline. But, but that promo inspired me to send you a message (laughs) late on Wednesday night this week where I said, you know, no matter what he signed, there is a non-zero chance that this man will create a storm of (laughs) (laughs) a shit storm. No matter what he signed, the chances are non-zero that a storm is coming. And then on Thursday this week, CM Punk apparently did an interview with ESPN to hype up uh, to hype up the Collision debut, mm-hmm. and it it began to leak on Thursday this week that our friend, the guy we know, <laughs> CM Punk, uh, uh, decided to use that ESPN interview to shoot on some people. And people are going to be mad, apparently, about this interview. And I thought, you know what? This guy never lets me down. (laughs) It made my week. It's the most fun I've had in wrestling in 18 years. (laughs) I'm so glad our guy is back. And I can't wait to see the CSPN interview drop. And now I can't wait for Collision on Saturday. So I'm not sure if that was their intent. But uh, anyway, what do you think about uh, about our boy Phil coming back? The debut of Collision, which will include AT&T title match. And uh, we can break down the matches after I get uh, your thoughts on mm-hmm. CM Punk. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I'm thrilled. This is, <laughs> you know, coming into this week, we were talking just before we uh, came on the air here. Uh, wasn't uh, wasn't particularly jazzed, as you, as you just said. It was... Uh, not the the most inspired build as we sort of got drip fed little nuggets about the show where it was going to take place who was going to be there and then the we got the match announcement last week that it was going to be that punk would be wrestling on the first show um but it just didn't feel very exciting um but as as you said our our guy phil our real life friend it's not a parasocial relationship. He's my real friend because he never lets me down when it comes to stuff like this. Uh, and he didn't let us down again. It's beautiful. Um, I love it because whether in this ESPN interview, as it turns out, whether he is 100% shooting or mixing some shoot with some work to try to drum up interest in his show, 
Um, if he tries to do a worked shoot thing about the elite, who all from all from all uh, all sources seem to want nothing to do with the man, I don't know that that really improves anything. Like unless he thinks, well, I can I can do such a compelling interview that I will force Tony and then the elite's hand to that it would be like business malpractice to not put us together on TV. Um, I will see, <laughs> but regardless, uh, CM Punk drumming up a little, uh, a little controversy yet again. Uh, this has made me so much more excited for collision for this prospect of CM Punk's return, which I was, you know, I was vaguely excited for because I think in general, he's one of the most, you know, he's one of the most compelling wrestling performers of the last 20 years um but i wasn't i wasn't really that excited but now that i know the real <laughs> i was a little concerned i mentioned this to you off air that we were gonna get a uh, nice guy phil who showed up in august of 2021 and buying buying gift cards for the women's locker room huh? mm-hmm. taking taking mark picks with uh with everybody who knocked on his, his dressing room door i don't want that guy that guy sucks <laughs> I want I want the real Phil Brooks to show up in this ESPN interview and live on TNT every Saturday night for the foreseeable future. And as we have established for a long time on the show, the real F- Phil Brooks is the meanest human being on the planet. And that's where he really thrives. It's really exciting. It's really fun. I just... Uh... Uh, it's this is pro wrestling. It's mm-hmm. the other company is this sanitized, whatever it's become, corporate conglomerate where everyone's just best friends and trying to put on the best show, and mm-hmm. everyone gets along and everyone gets a standing ovation when they come back through the curtain after they win a championship. It's mm-hmm. fantastic. And then the other company. Is this? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's wonderful. It's beautiful. Uh, and a fun wrinkle to this, by the way, is that uh, as far as we know, the elite are uh, free agents at the end of this year. Yeah. So if yep. Phil wanted to maybe make uh, make things unpleasant for them, they could. Uh, speaking of that, uh, that nice, quiet little uh, other wrestling federation where where nobody gets in any arguments and everyone's best friends. Uh, you know, maybe maybe the young bucks go go looking and and go join with their still very good friend, I'm sure, Cody Rhodes, in uh, in the or at least maybe they threaten to do that in the same way that like Hall and Nash would threaten to quit <laughs> when you know something wasn't going their way on Nitro. It is fascinating and a fascinating wrinkle to all this, and we've talked about it um, a little bit on the show and much more off air. If you had asked me six months ago, who's the next member of the elite to leave all elite wrestling? I would have said Kenny Omega hands down. Mm -hmm. And now, to me, the most likely scenario, just from things that we've heard and what we know about everyone involved, it would seem to me there's a pretty good chance Kenny Omega and Hangman Page stay and make nice and work with Phil and the problem children that have been assigned to Saturdays. And it's the Bucks who are the next out the door. Because Tony Khan has made it quite clear, even if he won't come out and say it, he's chosen sides. Mm -hmm. He's chosen CM Punk over the elite. He has decided, I understand that this man disparaged you in public and punched you in private, (laughs) whether he was justified in doing so or not. I understand there are bad feelings here. And then you went on television and mocked him and all these things. But he's very important. to. He's more important to this company than your feelings. And so I'm bringing him back and giving him his own television show. (laughs) (laughs) It doesn't get much more clear than that. It's like these guys have been cucked in their own company. Mm -hmm. They were 
three and a half, four years, almost four years ago, when they were their creative was basically taken away from them. They're no longer booking the tag team division after that dark order angle. Mm-hmm. And Tony started booking everything and being the the Vince McMahon, for lack of a better analogy, of AEW and booking everything. And Cody wasn't booking his own stuff anymore. And we're booking the singles division anymore. And at least not having final say. Mm-hmm. And the box weren't having final say anymore. They've repeatedly been cuckolded in their own company they're they're executives in name only and tony's made it clear which side he would be on so i think it's very fascinating that they have not uh, signed contract extensions yet i think they may realize maybe the best thing for us is just to use this to to uh to bargain with tony because we don't really want to go on the road and work the wwe schedule but uh but we'll see We'll see. I think the likelihood now is it's much more likely that the Young Bucks are the next members of the elite out the door. But what do I know? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a it's a much stronger possibility, like you said, than it was even a few months ago. Um, But yeah, because, yeah, to your point, they're not really in charge of anything anymore. Uh, And if you started this company and the pitch was this is wrestling, you know, for the boys, by the boys, and it's a team and and we're running it. And Tony's going to, you know, co- Tony's just going to kind of oversee things from afar and, and fund it. And then two months in that changed. And then, you know, all of the all of the punk stuff happened over the last year. Um, yeah, I what what do you uh, other than other than the paycheck and you know the other the other guys got deep pockets too so if you're i think if if i were them yeah i'd, I'd wanna i'd wanna let the contract expire and you know i mean not that you really have to let the contract expire to get an offer from wwe but you know if i would you know i'd let it come down to the wire and and see what you know see what the if the grass is a little greener on the other side because yeah if you're if you don't really have much of a role other than to show up and, you know, and do your own thing and do your matches and and then leave, it's like, well, you could, you could do that in somebody else's federation. And it's not like WWE is on, is on the road every single weekend anymore doing house shows and stuff, though they are a little bit more active in that than they were the last couple of years. Um, So, yeah, I would, I, I think it's, it's like, like, like you said, when you started all, uh, all of this last night, it's a non-zero chance for sure that the Bucks could uh, could look elsewhere when these when these deals are up at the end of the year. All right, so we've talked about the uh, backstage machinations of Collision. Collision debuts Saturday. We have CM Punk and FTR in a trios match against the Bang Bang Gang and <laughs> Samoa Joseph. Uh, we have Warlow defending the TNT title against the Luchasaurus. Mm-hmm. We have Miro returning to action on the show. No opponent announced. We have Buddy Matthews versus Andrade. 2019 ass WWE match. <laughs> and we have Sky Blue and Willow Nightingale versus the good members of the Outcasts, Tony Storm <laughs> and Ruby Soho. Um, it's a lineup. <laughs> sure. I, there aren't as many matches on this show booked where you can look at it and, and immediately tell who's going to win. So I guess there's that. Mm-hmm. Um, they seem to have tried harder than usual, I guess. Uh, interesting. <laughs> it's also not like a pay-per-view lineup. True. Uh, it's I would say it's a weaker lineup than Dynamite was this Wednesday, in fact. Mm-hmm. At least as far as, as marquee matches, we can get to that in a couple minutes. Yeah, we can talk about that. Um Adam Cole and MJF wrestled in a world title eliminator on Dynamite. And they did a time limit draw. Mm-hmm. And my thought when they booked the match was, well, Cole can go over here. And they will then do the rematch on the collision debut. That I think that would make sense. And uh, you were like, you pointed correctly pointed out. It's apparently of all the 
dozens of world title or any kind of title eliminator matches that AEW has ever done, only two times has the uh, challenger defeated the champion in those matches. And I I don't think it's ever happened in a world title match. So, right. So Cole did not beat MJF. They went to a time limit draw and they did not book a return match <laughs> for collision. <laughs> so there's that. And uh, I don't know where that leaves our friend Adam. Uh, I don't know. We know that MGF is now wrestling Tanahashi at Forbidden Door. <laughs> Very strange match. Mm-hmm. Um, and for the uh, AEW world title. And uh, just I can we touch on that real quick and then we'll move on to the uh, to the main event angle. But uh, any thoughts on how that world title scenario played out on Dynamite? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when you said, oh, they'll they'll do a they'll, they'll have Adam Cole win here or we were talking about a draw. If they do a draw, they can just book the rematch, whatever they do. They'll 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 book the rematch for Saturday. And then they didn't. Um, and then, as mentioned, MJF has a, another title opponent, although they're teasing that he simply shan't show up for the match. Um, great, great idea. Great idea. What? I think I don't look. I mean, everyone's buying the show for the top two matches. So I guess you could do you can get uh, real creative on your undercard for this show. But uh, yeah, it's it's a weird, weird thing to do. <laughs> but yeah, I guess Adam Cole versus MJF is the title match for the the Wembley show maybe um I mean you got a lot of time between now and then so I guess you could just do it on another dynamite or collision after Forbidden Door but yeah it is weird that uh you know Cole went to a draw with him and somebody else from another company is getting the next title shot against MJF yeah that's bizarre we get 10 11 weeks before the next pay per view, after Forbidden Door, that sounds oh, excruciating. <laughs> they do have a series of dynamites that they like to do in the summer, where they have like Fight for the Fallen and Fighter Fest and mm-hmm. Road Rager and all these special episodes that take two weeks to complete. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. <laughs> and they have the uh, the Owen tournament starting on their on their big Canadian tour. Good lord, I forgot about that, and apparently they did too. Uh, you would not know anything about that. Did you see the on... pictures of 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 Jeff Jarrett and Martha reuniting, though? Uh, I believe I did. Yes, that was because, very sweet. Because Jeff and Owen were like best friends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> strange. <laughs> it's very strange. <laughs> All of it is very strange, but very nice. Yes. Um, speaking of Jeff, you pointed out to me. That uh, there's a lot of ref bumps Mm -hmm. in AEW now. And uh, I pointed out to you. I'm not sure they ever did a single ref bump in AEW until the MJF Moxley title match at full gear last year. Mm -hmm. About six, six, seven months ago. And now it seems now it seems there's a ref bump on every show. (laughs) And you think this is Jeff Jarrett's fault. (laughs) I'm just saying. Historically speaking, there are a lot of ref bumps in uh, territories that Jeff Jarrett is either on top in or is booking or has a hand in booking. So, and if you line up the timeline, he came in and uh, well, gosh, it was the Baltimore show I was at in October of last year. Yeah. And that, that pay-per-view match with Moxley and MJF was at November. So <laughs> there's some common denominator. Somebody, somebody's in the, uh, in big TK's ear telling him to to book a thousand ref bumps. Yeah. As as I saw someone on Twitter say, the dial from ROH has been turned closer to the TNA side. Sure. Sure, why not? Um, uh, let's see. What else have they announced? Uh they uh did a big show closing angle on Dynamite where the Elite and the Blackpool Combat Club, after they had a match. The losers jumped the winners to get their heat back. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Eddie Kingston returned to uh, to save the elite and tease whether whose side is he on, Mm -hmm. whether he he hates Claudio. That much is clear. He went after Claudio right away. So those two were in a program over the Ring of Honor title before Kingston was sidelined with hernia surgery. Um, 
and have decades of, of animosity. Mm-hmm. But uh, Moxley and Kingston then uh, teased, well, are we going to fight? Or are we going to be friends? Because they have both fought and been friends in AEW. Mm-hmm. We, they were friends, I think, when last we saw them. But those two didn't, did not, would not fight each other. But uh, then uh, Takeshi got involved, and then Will Osprey got involved and attacked Omega to set up their Forbidden Door match. And we now have uh, four matches set, I believe, for the um, for the Forbidden Door. We have um, Tanahashi and MJF naturally for the uh, <laughs> AEW title. We have the Omega and Osprey rematch and the Okada and Danielson match, which are clearly the two selling points. And then um, Sonata is going to defend the IWGP <laughs> world title against the Jungle Boy. <laughs> they say it's for the IWGP heavyweight championship, but it's actually for the title of most handsome boy. Wow. <laughs> that's huge. That's, that's a big prize. <laughs> hotly contested in, in AEW, but it'll be decided between Sonata and, and Jungle Jack. Wow. A lot of discourse this week about um, about this, and it all just really drives me insane because <laughs> here's what we know about AEW. 130 to 140,000 people buy each and every one of their pay-per-views. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what creative they do it doesn't matter what matches they book that's the audience and that's the audience that loves everything aew and is going to support this company it's um uh the alternative brand to the evil empire Mm -hmm. and their hardcore fan base loves it and they're going to support it no matter what so it doesn't matter one iota what the creative is in AEW. Mm-hmm. And it never has, because frankly, it's never been any good. The creative has not been any good. So and this this is the hardcore fan base pay-per-view where you're just selling them dream matches and you're selling them Danielson and Okada and you're giving them the Omega and Osprey rematch. And it really doesn't matter the discourse about we need to introduce the new japan people it drives me insane it's like it doesn't matter it also, doesn't matter i also think they have this year like there's been multiple video packages for osprey and omega and for okada and danielson and they introduced i don't know how sonata could have introduced himself better than going hello i am sonata i'm the iwgp heavyweight champion because that's literally what he said so you know, I don't know. Like, I think they've it's it's been fine. Like, like they're and again, it's yeah, it's it's a dream match pay per view, and they have actual dream matches on the show this year, so that's also good. <laughs> like, it's a it's a big upgrade as far as actually delivering. I think what the the potential of this idea is over last year. Yes. So there's that. <laughs> Um, so really looking forward to, um, not looking forward to two more hours of wrestling. I have to watch every week, uh, particularly on Saturdays, which are usually a slow day unless there's a WWE pay-per-view. Uh, so, but we have a lot to look forward to with our friend Phil. So there's right. that. Only, WWE... only other dynamite note I wanted, which is that we were oh, yeah. about was, uh, that, uh, it turns out if you take Soraya out of that outcast act, it's pretty good. <laughs> Tony Storm, Ruby Soho, pretty good. Pretty good television <laughs> performers. <laughs> pretty good wrestlers. They're good wrestlers. Tony Storm's a really good promo. Ruby is unique and a good promo in her own way. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily a traditional pro wrestling promo, but these are two compelling television performers that if you just let them play off each other and you let them be the biggest stars in their act turns out pretty good yeah just an idea (laughs) throwing that one out there well 
they had to turn them heel because Soraya couldn't get over his baby face. <laughs> and Soraya, I'm sure, is making more than those two combined. Sure. Sure. So at a certain point, this becomes a cost benefit analysis. So perhaps uh, perhaps she could go to collision. And uh, and, and be on Phil. She's 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 a Phil crony, isn't she? They were on that WWE show that nobody watched on Fox Sports together. Well, so were Phil and Renee, and <laughs> Phil ended up feuding with Renee's husband. True. <laughs> In real life. True. So so I don't know what that matters. Uh I don't know what that matters, but that's that's fascinating. <laughs> Uh, Money in the Bank, as we switch to the other promotion here, Money in the Bank is uh, about two weeks away here. It's uh, two weeks from Saturday. It's July 1st in London. Logan Paul is coming back to WWE on this week, this upcoming Raw. Uh, they also introduced new uh, women's title belts, and one is the Undisputed Women's Championship and uh, Asuka has that belt, and uh, Charlotte Flair wants that belt. And then the other one is uh, Rhea Ripley's belt, and uh, I'm not sure who wants that one. Uh, but <laughs> they've given the women new championships. What do you and, think? Uh, they've given them new championships, and they are slightly smaller version of the men's championships with white straps instead of black ones. <laughs> This is uh this is Uncle Paul's uh NXT formula in terms of the titles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And look, we we've talked about this. I don't know if we talked about it on the show, but uh we're never getting away from WWE putting a giant WWE logo in the center of their belts because they ship those out to sports teams when they win the Super Bowl or the NBA Finals or what have you. Right. Um and so they want a giant WWE logo present at all of those events. I get it. It's fine. I don't hate the look of those belts. I mean, the the new world heavyweight title, I think, is not great. But it's it's not the worst thing I've ever seen. Right. Um, but yeah, it didn't, it, it's better than what they were doing for the last two months, which was having Asuka be the Raw Women's Champion on SmackDown and have Rhea be the SmackDown women's champion on raw. Uh, I prefer it to that. And I also prefer it to the thing they did the last couple of years where the raw champions and the SmackDown champions just exchanged belts with each other. Um, yeah. So yeah. yes, this is, this is the best of all of those scenarios. Yeah, there's that money in the bank. The line up here. Uh, to this point, the men's money in the bank field has been finalized. Shinsuke Nakamura, Ricochet, L.A. Knight, Santos Escobar, Butch, and Damian Priest. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> and maybe you think they're going to add Logan Paul to it? Um, I don't didn't immediately jump to mind as the obvious thing to me but what do i know i don't know what do you think that, i mean basically just because it didn't seem to me there was anyone clear that he was coming back to feud with um i mean i guess they could set that up on monday obviously i'm sure there's somebody that's not in money in the bank that he could have a match with but um yeah i just i just thought i was like well he always jumps off a high thing so could have That's... him jump off a ladder and splash somebody through an announce table for his, uh, you know, his TikTok or whatever. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, I thought they were just putting him on the show because he's under contract and they're in they're in his hometown. Oh well, there like, you go. That could be it. Too. <laughs> like Raw's in Cleveland. He's from a Cleveland suburb. Like I don't know. I I I don't. Maybe he's coming back for something. Maybe he's not coming back for something. You know what I mean? Like it could be any number of a thousand things. Is what sure. I'm saying. Sure. Um, other than, than that, is there a winner here that stands out? LA Knight is obviously the people's choice. And then I think other than that, it's pretty much, uh, Damian Priest would be the office choice. So yeah. I don't know. Doesn't, they don't seem interested in pushing LA Knight at the level that fans 
want to push him at. Oh, absolutely not. And maybe that's because he's 39 years old and he reminds Paul of his Ken Kennedy. Those, <laughs> yes, of Ken Kennedy and Dwayne Johnson, <laughs> two of his least favorite people in the history of the wrestling business. Um, but uh, yeah, I so I like, yeah, he should probably win. Um, but I, yeah, I think Priest, they're teasing dissension between Priest and Valor. Mm. So you give Priest the briefcase. Balor is currently going for the world title against Seth at this show. That is, of course, assuming that Seth is able to uh, fend off Braun Breaker on NXT next week. Um, and whoever he defends the title against in an open challenge on Raw this week. Ah, there you go. Yeah. So it's assuming he, he's still the champion at Money, uh, Money in the he, Bank. He has two title defenses announced before the paper. <laughs> what? And, uh, Whoever the champion may be will be facing Finn. So the idea of like Finn goes for the title for a few months, tries to win it, doesn't, and then Priest wins and Finn's jealous. And then you turn Priest babyface seems like a a WWE, a logical WWE way of, of looking at things to get a to get a new a new guy that they like over as babyface. Priest, one of the few wrestlers still active, older than I am. <laughs> but he's he's the hot young guy we're gonna what he's a hot young guy huh that we're going to put the uh, money in the bank briefcase on okay well, well speaking <laughs> sure. of which i mean la's are they the same age is la like 39 la might be a little older yeah, yeah they're both in that in that in that age range yeah priest may be 40 already now i gotta look this up let's <laughs> see l a night yeah, L.A. Knight is uh, 40 years old. Okay. He'll be 41 in November. So he is, uh, he's from Hagerstown, Maryland. Is that right? Ha- Hagerstown, Maryland, if you've never been there, <laughs> there's probably a reason for that. If there's, an, there's one shopping center there, maybe two. <laughs> I haven't been there in like four or five years, but it was... Desolate last time I was there. Him and and uh, James Ellsworth are from there. <laughs> ew, what do you know? And uh, Damian Priest is also 40 years old, and he will be 41 in September. So Priest is actually older than L.A. Knight. Oh, okay. <laughs> By a couple of months. The battle of two men that really should have been signed like 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you know about that? Uh, all right, so that's the men's money in the bank field, the women's money in the bank field. Becky Lynch, Bailey, Io Sky, Zoe Stark, Selena Vega, and one spot still to be determined. So they'll have a quote unquote last chance match or some other kind of qualifying match sometime over the next two weeks to set to set the women's field. Mm-hmm. I assume Becky and uh, Zoe are in the they're uh they get that side quest going with the Trish Stratus feud. Mm-hmm. So I assume they aren't winning. Zelina Vega probably not. <laughs> I think Eo Sky is the pick here unless they uh whoever the sixth person they add to that match uh is the pick. I think a babyface Eo Sky is is a possibility here. What do you think? Yeah, that makes us most the most sense of anything. Um, Becky is certainly not working this like she's winning it. <laughs> <laughs> she is treating this the way that like Kevin Nash would treat going for the world tag titles <laughs> in 1999. She is treating this the way that Dwayne Johnson treated feuding with Billy Gunn. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> with the appropriate amount of uh, disinterest. <laughs> I was happy when uh, when she came back, and uh, even if it was a heel, I was like, you know, if she wants to come back, and the the caveat was, well, you know, I want to try something different and be a heel. I'm not sure whether it was actually her idea, as she has said, or if it was Vince's idea, because something's wrong with him. But regardless, I was like, well, you know what? Becky Lynch back, half mailing it in, is better to me than having no Becky Lynch. And then we're a couple of years into this now, and 
I finally thought with that with the secret plan being enacted and the Trish Stratus feud taking place this summer, it's like, well, they've finally given her something she can sink her teeth into. Mm-hmm. And um and some of her promos and stuff have been better and they let her talk some and then you sent me a uh, a, a interview that she did on uh, one of the digital platforms this week it was on raw talk and uh, WWE's digital platforms where she's climbing a ladder in the locker room for practice for money in the bank and it's like <laughs> this this one this woman this was the biggest star in the industry for about 18 months. Mm-hmm. And uh, and now she's doing comedy promos, climbing a ladder in in the locker room on Raw Talk. It's like they have they have this is promotional malpractice. <laughs> you know, and, often, and to your point, she's treating it as yes. such. And now oftentimes the less someone cares on WWE programming, the more entertaining they are. So I personally am all for this, but yes, it's, she does not seem particularly dialed in and they are not giving her, I mean, they're the, they'll, they'll get back to the, the Trish feud, I guess, after, after money in the bank and, and, you know, maybe Becky gets a partner and you do a tag or you, you know, you do a something, you do a cage match with her and Trish or something. So maybe she'll get something more out of that once they get once they get that back on track. But uh, yeah, <laughs> as of now, she is incredibly disinterested. And I just like I want to see how many I want to count the number of bumps she takes in this ladder match. <laughs> like I don't think she's doing a leg drop off the ladder through a table this time, you know. You never know. You never know. But you, yes, yes, she is. <laughs> Treating this like Kevin Ash. It's really the highest compliment we can pay a wrestler. Absolutely. <laughs> They're treating something. You sent me a note today. Kevin Nash was saying on his podcast that uh Endeavor or WWE the merger hasn't gone through yet. So basically the WWE has cut or the, since WWE has announced the UFC merger and the TKO company that a lot of the legends have seen their merchandise or their royalty checks cut. And um, that Nash said on his podcast that if this continues, he's going to have to give Ari Emanuel a call. <laughs> and it was just that's that's pretty fascinating. Like I saw on a clip on his YouTube channel, Nash talking about uh, the NWO royalties that he and Hall, or I guess Hall's estate mm-hmm. and Hogan get in perpetuity on the NWO merchandise and as they each get 16.7% royalties Ooh. on any NWO merch sold. And it's been that way since they returned to the company in 2002. Anything NWO because they get a 16.7% royalty on. And they've That's... been selling them, they you know, since like whenever they started doing the retro shirts in like 2010 or whatever, yes. like NW, they've been selling a lot of NWO stuff for the last 15 years. Yes, that's uh, that's a nice pension there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would be mad too if suddenly that got cut in half, <laughs> absolutely. So, yeah, but the, really, what higher compliment can we pay anyone than <laughs> Becky Lynch just treating her? Her current her current booking the way Kevin Nash would. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's, wonderful. it's wonderful. Um, what else is set for money in the bank? Seth Rollins and Finn Bauer. We already touched on that. They're uh, building this around uh, six SummerSlam from six years ago, where Seth injured Finn and uh, ruined his life. <laughs> yes, and uh, the butterfly effect effect of all that, and then uh, Cody Rhodes wrestling Dominic Mysterio. <laughs> This, this feels bizarre, uh, but it's something to keep Cody busy, keep him out of money in the bank until Brock shows up and they do their SummerSlam match, I assume. So sure. I'm, hope, I'm hoping Brock shows up and and lays Cody out and Dominic gets the pin here. Let's get, let's get some heat, brother. That's uh, That would be something. That would be... A decision you could make. <laughs> it's one of those things where, like, 
Dominic is such a is the type of character that really should never win a match. <laughs> right. Or if he does, he should win when like his lifeless body is dragged on top of the other guy after eight people lay him out. Yeah. But so it does feel like a weird step down that Cody Rhodes, who main evented WrestleMania and felt like the hottest guy in the company two months ago, is uh, is now wrestling him. But you know, like you said, it's 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 a match. It's like that year that Roman wrestled Jinder <laughs> on a one off show. Like it's just like like what? I have no me- no memory of that whatsoever. There's there's a Roman Jinder pay per view match. I swear to God. <laughs> uh, All right from like the summer of well I'll say 2018 or maybe 2019 but uh they yeah they so it's just like just it's, it's he it's beneath <laughs> the baby face star of the match but it it is something to do and Dominic does get a lot of heat so I'm sure the match I'm sure the match itself will be really fun like oh, yeah. and I'm, and like if they did this match on a house show it would be a hoot I don't yes. know about you know building to a pay per view match, but I'm sure, like I said, it's it's a it's going to be a, a good crowd in London. I'm sure, so I'm sure it'll be a lot of fun. So I don't have tickets yet, and I haven't completely decided yet. But Raw July third is in Baltimore, mm-hmm. and the the downside is, of course, it's immediately following the conclusion of a European tour. <laughs> and the talent is going to be completely toast. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, which often happens on Baltimore shows because of how they route these things. And we're on the East Coast mm-hmm. and we're either right before they leave for a European tour or right after they get back from a European tour. <laughs> oh, the timing of this is, is not, you know, not that you go to Raw, Monday Night Raw for the wonderful wrestling. <laughs> You go to see the wonderful variety show. That's right. right. <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, we have talked a lot of AEW. We have talked a lot of WWE. Um, is there anything else you want to get into here? Uh, my condolences to Dwayne Johnson on Young Rock being canceled after three seasons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have a lot to add. <laughs> He needs a hit. He really does. Better hope this this Hobbs spinoff movie, this in between cool Fast and the Furious he's doing, that's built around him. Uh, he better hope that one's that uh, is a home run. XFL lost sixty million dollars, <laughs> which as you pointed out to me, how? Like, <laughs> like, I don't know. Where, where on this product does it look like they spent? Five million dollars, let alone sixty. Right. I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you. Um. Yeah. So, uh, best wishes. <laughs> We're best for you, DJ. Today. Yeah. And um, I got a uh, I got a piece of mail this week, and it's from Stratus Enterprises. And mm-hmm. I'm like, what? I didn't order anything. What is? And then I opened it. It's an autographed picture of Trish Stratus. And then I'm like, oh, if you bought her WrestleMania shirt, uh, she said that she would send an autographed picture. And then I bought the WrestleMania shirt, uh, you know, two months ago. And mm-hmm. I opened the package and there was a little piece of paper in there. that said, we'll send autographed photo later. <laughs> <laughs> so then didn't have time. Yeah. Uh, so then two months later, I get an envelope from Stratus Enterprises. So just Trish Stratus keeps her promises, everybody. That's really all that you need to know. That will set an autograph later. It's not the same, but it has the same energy of Ringo Starr saying he will not be <laughs> asking fans not to send him any more fan mm-hmm. mail. He simply gets... Busy. Yes. <laughs> He we'll posted a video on his social media asking fans not to send him any more fan mail because he's just overwhelmed with all the fan mail he gets and he can't possibly respond to it anymore any longer. Wow, weird. Yeah, he's just too busy to send that autograph. But unlike Ringo, she she came through for you in the end. Yes. The secret plan is still in still in effect. Yep. Man, it's so great. Well, Phil's back. 
Can't wait to see what he does on Collision this week. Can't wait to see what this ESPN interview is like now that we've been hyped on it so much. And uh, we have a lot to look forward to as always. So, till next time, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Phil has a show. The Bucks have a show. <laughs> and Jimmy Kimmel has a show. <laughs> Phil just went home like, yeah, I'll be over here if you need me. <laughs> they said, they said, Phil, go to Saturdays. And he said, yeah, all right, not a bad idea. <laughs> I, I was going to suggest that. Java monster. There you go. Now we're Now we're talking. Now you're speaking my language. I work I work till six tomorrow. I'm gonna have at least one, possibly two of those. Mm-hmm. And then I won't be able to sleep. And then I have to work Saturday morning. <laughs> it's a fun little trick I play on myself every <laughs> every time I work uh, the late shift on a on a Friday night. Yeah, this is it was playing a trick. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be in the lobby if you need me. <laughs> uh, I think there's room for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I was going to suggest that. <laughs> Just think you and I and anyone lucky enough to have $3,500 to spare could be learning comedy from Jay and... Uh, and equally <laughs> white hot relevant Adam Carolla, plus the writers of the less famous Tim Allen sitcom, and more. That's right, comedy fantasy camp. <laughs> I guess okay. there's a, there's a market for that, right? They're, I mean they they do like a spring training fantasy camp. They do a you know like first so for like comedy nerds. But it's not like like trendy comedy nerds, you know. You're not getting like, uh, you know, people who wrote S- the Silicon Valley or some like, you know, real trendy HBO show. So it's like, what is the market for a comedy fantasy camp with like a bunch of sixty year old <laughs> sitcom writers? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer for you. You know, a few hundred thousand people download and listen to Adam Carolla every day. So I'm guessing, uh, I'm guessing really middle aged or rapidly approaching middle aged white guys like myself is the, uh, is the target. But like, I know, t- I know too much. <laughs> I try to keep on keeping on.